Okay, recording is on. Class is now officially in session. Let's start off with the answers to last time's quiz, as we usually do. Okay, so what level of high school physics and math do you need? Okay, so the reason why I went through that big long derivation last time, remember how, how ugly that was? Um, the reason I did that was not because I expect the, you to be able to do that yourselves on a test. Um, I just wanted to show you that I, it, it's something that a high school student could do. Um, calculating the radius of the orbit, that was very straightforward. Any of you could, do, could have done that. Calculating the kinetic energy of the electron in any of the orbits, very straightforward. Any of you could do that. Calculating the potential energy, that was a little trickier. You needed to know out, uh, you needed to know calculus in order to do that. But many of you know calculus, and the rest of you will definitely know uh, calculus hopefully next year when you take it. Uh, so all of these questions here, uh, or all of the work that we did here is work that a high school student could do. And that, and that was the point that I wanted to drive home. This is not really advanced stuff. Now, if you go beyond hydrogen, okay, if you try to do it for a helium atom or, or any other atom, okay, then you get some complexities involved because you got, you've got more than one electron now buzzing around there and those electrons inter, inter, interact in strange ways. So yeah, th then it gets really complicated. But as long as you stick with hydrogen, then hey, uh, you know, high school math and physics is good enough. And Jaron, don't worry, it is okay, you can retake the quiz. Okay, so why do the energy levels have negative values? Okay, so that's like I said last time, if I wanna know what the potential energy of my cell phone is, you know, we're used to, to picking some reference level that's, that's below the cell phone, you know, either the tabletop or the floor. But we don't have to do that. We could pick the ceiling. We could say that our reference height for the uh, uh, potential energy is the ceiling. So no matter where my, my cell phone is, the potential energy is always going to be negative. But that's okay because all I care about is the difference, okay? So if I want to know uh, what the potential energy is here, uh, and it works out to be a negative number, that's okay. Because if I were to drop it down to here and I wanna know how fast it's going, then whatever the potential energy difference is between here and here, that's uh, that's how much kinetic, kinetic energy it's going to have when it reaches down here. The fact that they're negative is is nothing at all to worry about. And so when you're, when you're dealing with uh, electrons going around um, around protons, it's more convenient to pick the potential energy to be zero at a place that's that's infinitely far away, which is basically like picking it at the ceiling. Okay, so that's fine, no problem with that. All right, now the radius for the lowest energy level of an electron that's orbiting a hydrogen. Now, I realize that many of you and maybe even most of you just Googled the answer here, which you know I never said you couldn't, so okay, fine. But what I really wanted you to do was to take this equation, which we derived last time. And you know what? I might make this be a derivation on our test. I, I, I wouldn't make you do the energy levels, but deriving this equation that you see right here, that's fair game. I might put that on the test. And so I would recommend uh, go back and rewatch last time's video. And this, and this time you can pause it at every little step, write it all down. This is an equation that I want you to know how to use. Now, remember that the number you stick in for n there, uh, that's gonna be the number of wavelengths that is around the circle. So the lowest level is n equals one. You guys know Planck's constant, you know Coulomb's constant, you know the charge on an electron, you know the mass of an electron. So I would hope that you would use this formula to calculate that. So one question that I might ask on the test that we're gonna take very soon is I might say, what's the radius of the N equals 17 level? Okay, you're gonna have trouble Googling that one. I'm sure it's probably in Google somewhere, but, but just plug in 17 into this equation. Make, su make sure you square the 17. Okay. So I think this is an important question. All right. 
So now we've got an electron that's been excited to the n equals five level by some means. There's lots of ways we could, we could get it up there. And then it drops down to the n equals three level. So we wanna know how much energy that photon's gonna have. Okay, well, we could use the equations that I gave you last time, but here's a case where I would recommend, don't do it that way, just use this chart right here. So this chart is in your book. And by the way, I would recommend that when you're taking the test, have a bookmark in, in there on this page because there's a very good probability that this chart will come in very handy on the test, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Okay, so if we wanna answer the question here, so first thing we need, to know, we need to know is what is the energy of an electron that's in the n equals five level? So here's n equals five level. So we come over here, we find out that the energy for that guy is, is negative 0 0.054, okay? And then we do the same thing for the n equals three level. What's the energy for that? And it turns out to be negative 1.51. Now these are all in electron volts, not joules, but you know, that's okay, you guys can easily convert. All right, so we want if so if we want to know what is the energy the photon is going to have. Well, it's just going to be the difference between those two. Okay, whatever the difference is, that's the energy that the emitted photon is going to have. Or if we did it the other way around, let's say we start off at n equals three, and we want to go to n equals five, that would be the energy that we need to give the electron in order to jump up there. Okay, now I could also say, all right, great, but what is the wavelength of the photon? So you guys, hopefully you know, you can use E equals HF, uh, where you replace F with C over lambda. So E equals HC over lambda. You know E, you know H, you can calculate lambda. Okay, so I, th in fact, I can guarantee there will be a question like this on the test. Make sure you know how to do it. Okay, the secret phrase, we got that there. All right, so that's it for the quiz. Uh, before we go on to last night's homework, are there any questions about the quiz? I'm going to assume that no news means no questions. So let's talk about last night's homework. Okay, so I trust you've already looked up the answers to all the odd number ones. So here are the answers to the even ones. I'll give you a minute to look those over. If any of you have any questions, go ahead and either type them into the chat box or turn on your microphone and uh, you can ask your questions that way. Not seeing or hearing any questions. So that's either a good sign or a bad sign. Usually it's the latter. Number eight, okay, yes, we can definitely do number eight. Um, except that I didn't, oh, good, okay, good. I need these, I can't read without these. Okay. So it says the ground state of a helium ion is negative 54.4, okay? And so somehow an electron has gotten kicked up to a higher level and then it's gonna drop down from that higher level back down to the ground state. And they're saying that the energy that's emitted, or well, they're saying that the photon that's emitted has a wavelength of 30, of 304 nanometers. Okay. so. Let's do that one. Um, let me switch to share my white screen here. Okay, so we know that the, the, uh, the uh, wavelength of the photon, so what we need is the energy of the photon. Okay, so we could use, oops, that wasn't what I wanted. Let me try that again. Okay, we could say, go with E, equals HF, okay, um, and which is HC over lambda, okay. Now the energy, uh, if, we, if we use this equation, the energy is gonna come out in joules, um, and they give it to us in electron volts. That's okay, we could convert it. Okay, so we, so we know the wavelength, we know the speed of light, we know Planck's constant, so we could calculate E, but it's gonna be in joules. So then we convert that into electron volts. Or remember that one, that weird equation that they gave you where they said that the energy 
is equal to some number, which I think was 1240. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, divided by the wavelength. Remember that? Okay, that equation only works if lambda is in nanometers. Okay, so they, they, they did give it to us in nanometers. So what we could do is we could take the number 304 and plug it in for lambda. And then whatever number comes out, that number will not be in joules. That number will be in electron volts. So let, let's go ahead and do that. that. This is a case where I think their simplified formula is good. But when in doubt, use the good old E equals HF. That'll never let you down. It's just a little bit more work because you have to convert it into, uh, into uh, joules or from joules to coulombs. Okay, so I'm gonna take, uh, I'm gonna take 1240, and I'm gonna divide that by 304. And notice, I'm not gonna divide it by 304 times 10 to the negative nine. I'm just gonna divide it by 304, okay? And so I get 4.07, all right? So if the ground state is negative 54, and then this thing is 4.1 above that, then I'm gonna get, uh, uh, what, let's see, when, when was it, 54.4, okay. Okay, so I'm getting 50.3. Um, oh, I see, okay, yeah, the negative signs. Yeah, I, I can understand the negative signs, they can be confusing. Um, but I think we're good there. And uh, let's see, Ellie wanted, so, so are we good on number eight, yes? I'll assume the answer is yes, unless I see otherwise. So, okay, good. All right, Ellie wants to do number six. So let's do number six. Okay, so we want the wavelength of the light that's emitted in practice problems two and three. Okay, so in problem number two, um, where is problem number three? I don't even see problem. Let's just do problem number two. Okay, so, We've got a hydrogen item, hydrogen atom, the electron drops from n equals two to n equals one. Okay, so we calculate the energy level uh, of energy of, of two and uh, E2 and E1. Um, so they're saying that E1 is negative 13.6 and E2 is negative 3.4. So if we just subtract those two, okay, that'll tell us the energy of the photon. So actually, let's clear this out. Okay, so they're saying that the energy level, the ground state is negative 13.6, and the energy when it's up in the level two. Mr. Hendricks, I think you're making a mistake. Oh, that could be. I think it's asking for the uh, practice problem, not the oh, example that problem. Would, okay, that would explain, okay, that would explain why I couldn't see problem number three. Okay, so practice problem number two. Okay, all right, so tell you what. Let's, let's go back there. So let's look at the answer for practice problem number two. Okay, so practice problem number two. So the, the energy difference between the two levels was 1.89 electron volts. I trust that you're okay with that. And so now what they're saying is, okay, so if that was the energy level, then we need to find the wavelength and we need to figure out uh, which lines correspond. Okay, so the, so we know that, that uh, E, oh, let's see, let me annotate this. Okay, all right. So we know that E equals HF, which is in this case more conveniently written as HC over lambda. Okay, so this number right there, that is E except E, if we're gonna use E equals HF, it's gotta be in joules. Okay, so before we can, we, before we can put that into this formula, we need, we need to convert that into joules. So we know that 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules is equal to one electron volt. Okay, so we do that conversion and then we stick it into E. And we know that's equal to HC over lambda. So we know H, we know C, so we calculate lambda. Um, and that will tell us the wavelength, okay? And when they say what lines uh, correspond to the transition, okay, so let's go to figure 28.7, which is 
the, uh, let's see, 28.7, where's that one? Oh, okay, 28.7 is that's the one where they, they show you the dark uh, rectangle with the, the bright bands in it. Okay, so, so if the wavelength in this case turns out to be, um, oh, let's see, well, what does the wavelength turn out to be? Oh, okay, well, I guess it's right here. So the wavelength turns out to be 658, okay, nanometers. All right, so then we look on there and we say, okay, that 658, that would be the reddish one. Okay, so uh, does that answer everybody's question so on that? Who was it? I think it was Ellie. Were you the one that asked the question? Got to scroll up here. So yeah, that was Ellie. Okay, all right, good. Okay, well, are there any more questions on last night's homework? Okay, all right, I'm not seeing any more. So I'm gonna turn off annotation now. All right, so let's move on to the new stuff. All right, so, we are pretty much done with quantum mechanics right now. There is more that we could do, but there's just not enough time. And I, th I think that we've covered the most important stuff. You now know what it is. Um, I wish we had time to talk about really cool stuff like quantum entanglement. Uh, if you really want your mind blown, Google the phrase quantum entanglement. It's really cool. There's all sorts of neat stuff that we could talk about, but we're just, we, there's just not enough time to do it all. So we're gonna leave it now, okay? But the, the important thing about quantum mechanics as it relates to what we're gonna talk about today, which by the way is relativity. We're gonna go into relativity today. Quantum mechanics and relativity are intimately connected to each other. If it weren't for quantum mechanics, relativity would not do what it does. So the important thing to remember uh, for today is that quantum mechanics says that matter is not a little ball floating in empty space like we previously thought it was. Matter is actually a perturbation or a ripple. Let's think of ripple. Matter is actually a ripple in the fabric of the universe. Okay, so this picture that you see right here of the earth, just, you know, stretching out the fabric of the universe is not really the best way to draw the picture. The best way to draw the picture is get rid of the earth Leave the leave the the wrinkle there, leave the dimple there, but get rid of the earth, because that's what matter is. It's just a ripple in the fabric of the universe. Okay, so keep that in mind when we talk about the things that we're going to talk about for the next couple minutes here. Okay, so with that in mind, let's do a thought experiment. Okay, let's suppose that there's some scientist who, who somehow doesn't know what the speed of sound is. I don't know, I don't know how you can become a scientist without knowing that, but, but let's say that he doesn't know what the speed of sound is. Now you and I know that the speed of sound is 343 meters per second. At least that's what it is at sea level under standard conditions. Okay, so let's suppose that we've got a truck that is a really long truck. It's a flatbed truck and the bed of the truck here is long enough so that we can put a microphone and a firecracker and that they are separated by 343 meters, which I realize is an unrealistically long truck, but that's okay. All right, so for the first time we do this experiment, we're going to assume that the truck is not moving. So do you guys agree that if the uh, scientist here were to connect this microphone up to a very, very highly precise measuring tool, like the ones that we used back when we, remember the karate chop lab? Yeah, so we're gonna take the, uh, the, the equipment that we use for the karate chop lab, and we're gonna hook it up so that the computer knows when the firecracker went pop, and the computer knows when the microphone hears the pop. Okay, so if the truck is not moving, you guys agree it's gonna take one second before the microphone hears the pop? I hope you do, okay. So 
the scientist then, he knows that this distance is 343 meters. So he measures that it takes one second to tr for the sound to travel that distance. And so he, he then will calculate that the speed of sound is 343 meters per second. Yes, simple. Ah, but let's make it more interesting. Let's say, okay, what if the truck is moving? How's that going to affect things? Okay, so here's the truck at the instance that the firecracker goes pop. All right, but as the sound wave is traveling along, that microphone is not sitting still. The microphone is moving to the front, uh, moving forward. So by the time the sound wave finally gets to the microphone, you guys agree that that sound wave will have traveled a distance that's greater than 343 meters? I hope you would agree with that. I don't know, don't know how you could disagree with it. So this scientist who's trying to calculate the speed of light, one really important thing that I, that I put in writing here, but I didn't say verbally, the scientist for some reason doesn't notice that the truck is moving, okay? That, that's important. Okay, so he thinks that the sound wave traveled a distance of 343 meters. What he doesn't realize that it actually is that it actually traveled a greater distance. Okay, so he, so is it still gonna take one second? Well, obviously not, because you and I know that the sound wave actually travels a distance that's greater than 343. That means it's gonna take him more than one second. And so the, so the scientist then, when he calculates the speed of sound, uh, you know, if distance equals rate times time, then time equals distance divided, or then rate, rate then equals distance divided by time. And so then if the time works out to be greater than it was before, that means the number that he comes up with for the speed of the light, or speed of sound, is going to be slower. It's gonna be less than it was before. So yes, everybody agree this makes sense? Duh, of course, how could it be anything else? Okay, no questions? All right, good. Now, let's change the experiment. So instead of measuring the speed of sound, we want to measure the speed of light, okay? And if you thought my truck was unrealistic all along before, well, you ain't seen nothing. My new truck now, has a bed that's so long that it's 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters long. This is a phenomenally long truck, but everything else the same. Okay, so you and I know that the speed of light is 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, but the scientist for some reason doesn't know that. That's what he's trying to determine. Now he does know the distance. He did measure the distance out very carefully. Okay, he got out his meter stick and yeah, took a long, long time, but he, he, he figured it all out. Okay, so same as before, the computer knows when it goes pop and the computer knows when the photo sensor sees the flash. Okay, so we start the clock, the thing goes pop. Well, actually, well, I get ahead of myself. We got it, first time we got to do it, the truck's not moving, okay. Okay, so the truck's not moving, you guys hopefully agree that it's gonna take exactly one second between the pop and when the photosensor sees the light flash. Okay, so the scientist is gonna calculate the speed of light is 3.0 times 78 meters per second. Now here comes the fun part. So we're gonna do exactly the same thing this time that we did before. We're going to do it while the truck is moving. And for some reason, the, the scientist doesn't know that the truck is moving. Okay, so when the firecracker goes pop, this is where everything is located. And then when the, uh, when the light finally reaches the photosensor, the photosensor has moved. Therefore, the light had to travel a distance that's greater than three times 10 to the eighth, okay? Therefore, the amount of time uh, is, you know, it's, it, it, it's, gonna, it's gonna take longer. And so do you agree that like before, the, calc the scientist should come up with a number for the speed of light that's, that's lower? than what he got when the truck was not, was uh, sitting still. Do you guys not agree that that's the way it has to come out, right? How could it possibly come out any other way? It would be absurd if it came out any other way. Let's not worry about whether it's moving backwards, but, but the answer is yes, if it was moving backwards, it would be faster. But let's, let's stick with this one. Do you guys agree that 
the speed of light that he measures when the truck is moving would have to be smaller than it was before. Well, I got interesting news for you, gang. That's not what happens, okay? Scientists have done this experiment and lots and lots of different scientists have done it. And they always get the same number when they measure the speed of light, regardless of whether they're moving or whether they're not moving. Now your first reaction, first instinct might be to say, well, maybe their equipment just wasn't sensitive enough because the light goes so fast, it's hard to measure, hard to measure it. But they had equipment that was definitely sensitive enough. It was more than sensitive enough. If there had been a difference, they would have noticed it. Um, yeah, Jaron, I agree with what you're saying, but I'm not going to comment on it right now. I, 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 I want to, I want to stick with what we, uh, with this idea. Okay. So you guys agree that there's something seriously wrong here. If we get the same number when we measure the speed of light, regardless of whether we're moving or whether we're not. So we have a very interesting problem. This and we call it the speed of light problem if you want. Remember the photoelectric problem that we had before? And scientists really scratched their heads for a long, long time before before Einstein came along and said, well, hey, I've got an explanation for you. Well, this was the same thing. Uh, people had known about this problem for many years and just scratched their head for the longest time and couldn't come up with an explanation of it until Einstein came along. And Einstein said, hey guys, I've got, I've got an explanation for this, but you're not gonna like it. They said, well, okay, tell us what it is. Okay, so what he said was, well, maybe time slows down when you're moving. To which the other scientists responded, you were right when you said we're not gonna like it. We don't like it. That's crazy talk. How could time slow down when you're moving? That just, that doesn't make sense, okay? And so then what Einstein said was, well, hey, remember relativity? Remember back when, or I'm, I'm sorry, let me, let me say, what I meant to say was remember quantum mechanics. Okay, so, so Einstein says, remember quantum mechanics? When we learned about quantum mechanics, what we learned was that people who thought that matter was a little ball floating in empty space, well, it turns out those people are wrong. Matter is not an empty ball floating in, in outer space, in empty space. Matter is a ripple in the fabric of the universe. That's what matter actually is. So we are intimately connected with the fabric of the universe. So if we were to get pushed through space, through, if someone were to put us in a rocket or something and push us through the fabric of the universe at high speed, does it not make sense that we might feel some stress due to the fact that we're being pushed through the fabric of the universe at high speed and we are intimately connected with the fabric of the universe? It makes sense that, that, that we, would, we would feel some sort of a stress as a result of that. So if you're bothered by me saying, now this is Einstein, talking here. So Einstein says to him, if it bothers you that I, that I say, well, time slows down, how about if I rephrase that like this, okay? How about if I say that when we move quickly through the fabric of the universe, the resulting stress on the molecules that are in our bodies and also in our watches, okay, that, that we're using to measure time, right? So the, the, the molecules in our clock, they are also under, gonna go under this stress, which is gonna make them vibrate more slowly. And so that means that our watch is going to tick more slowly, okay? And then you might say, well, that's only one way of measuring time. And he says, yeah, but anything, anything else that you can think of as a measure of time, like for instance, how, how quickly your body ages, right? That's one way that we can measure time is the, how quickly your body ages. But if, you're, if the molecules in your body are also vibrating more slowly than they would otherwise, you know, because of this stress that they feel, so they're gonna vibrate more slowly, therefore you're gonna age more slowly. So every measure that you can possibly think of for measuring how fast time is flowing, it's all gonna slow down. 
your watch is going to tick more slowly, your body is going to age more slowly, your brain is going to think more slowly, okay? Because all the processes that are going in inside your brain are going to slow down. So it is in fact fair to say that time slows down because what is time anyway, you know? So it, it, it actually makes good sense if you think of it, if you think of relativity as in connection with quantum mechanics, it makes sense that yeah, time actually could slow down if you're, if you're moving quickly through the fabric of the universe. So I hope you guys agree that it's not so weird, okay? Time actually can slow down. All right, so I'm not seeing any questions. Um, so I'm going to, okay, I, I, uh, I take that back. I do see a question. Okay, so is that why it's called relativity? Because everything is relative. The answer to that is yes, okay? Time passes at different rates relative to what you are doing, okay? And it's not only time, but also other stuff that we're gonna talk about in just a few minutes. But let's stick with time for just a bit, okay? Um, okay, so let's, Let's see, okay, let's move. Let's see, wait a minute. That wasn't, am I missing a slide here? Okay, all right, well, okay, let's, let's do this, this will work. Okay, so what we are going to do then is we need to come up with an equation that relates time for a person in a moving spaceship to time for a person who's standing there watching that spaceship go by. We're going to derive what's called the time dilation equation. Now this is an important derivation and I am gonna go over this more slowly than I went over the quantum mechanics derivation. This is very definitely a uh, derivation that you might see when we take our next test. So get out your notebooks, open up to a new page, um, and so let's, let's derive it. Now, first we need to set up uh, the situation before we get into the math here. We need to set up how we're going to define time, okay? We're going to take advantage of the fact that everybody in the universe agrees on the speed of light, okay? The person in the spaceship, if he measures the speed of light, he's gonna get three times 10 to the eighth. The person on Earth, if he measures the speed of light, he's going to get three times 10 to the eighth. This is what we call the first postulate in relativity. Is that, and, and a, remember, a postulate is just a statement of what is observed to be true. And so that everybody in the universe, regardless of whether they're moving or not, when they measure the speed of light, they get the same number. So we're going to start with that as our first postulate. And we're going to use that to develop this equation. So what we need to do is we need to develop, we need a new clock. The, these, uh, the kinds of clocks that we've been using up until now, they're not going to be any good anymore because they, they don't give the same number. But, w but the speed of light is constant. So what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a clock that is based on light. So we're going to take two mirrors. Uh, let me rephrase that, sorry. We're gonna take a light bulb that we can turn on and off, and we're gonna take a mirror, and we're gonna, we're gonna separate them by an unknown distance. Maybe we're gonna make a tube. Let's think of it that way. Let's take a tube, okay, so, so, so here's this tube. So the light's down here, the mirror's up here, okay? And, and we're gonna define one second as the amount of, uh, time it takes for the light, once we turn it on, to, to travel through the tube and reach the mirror on the other side. Now, some of you might say, well, it's gonna be kind of hard to measure that. So if you really wanna be nitpicky, then I'll say, okay, what I'll do is I'll let the light start off, I'll let it hit the mirror, and when it comes back, so then the amount of time between when I, when I turned the light on and when I saw the flash come back, I'm gonna define that to be two seconds. And so whatever that time is, I'll just cut that in half. And so that will be my definition of one second according to this new light clock. Okay, all right, so the guy in the spaceship, he, he turns on the light. And now remember, the guy in the spaceship, he doesn't think that he's moving. 
He thinks he's at rest. He thinks that the girl here is the one who's moving. So he sees the, the light go up, hit the mirror, and come straight back down. Okay, so he says, okay, when it comes back down again, two seconds have gone by. Now the girl on the earth, she says, no, I'm not the one that's moving. You're the one that's moving. And the interesting thing is that she's going to say that that light did not just do a simple up and back uh, path, but actually that light traveled through this uh, V upside down V shape that you see here. Because when the light, uh, when the light uh, flashed out, okay, the light, remember this is not a laser now, this is a li regular light bulb that goes out in all directions. So some of the light goes up that way, but some of the light is also going this way. So in between the time when the light was first turned on and the time that the mirror saw the light, okay, that light did not travel straight up. That light traveled off at an angle here, or at least that's what the girl is going to say. Now, the guy disagrees, but that's okay. That's okay. All right. Okay, so then the girl is going to say, okay, well, the distance that the light traveled is actually much farther than what the guy says is the distance of the light traveled. Okay, so they disagree on how far did the light travel, but they do agree on, uh, on uh, what the speed of that light is. Okay, uh, let's see, let me go back to my, okay, so we've got a question come up here. Uh, why wouldn't it move in a sine wavy thing? Well, why would it move? I mean, because light travels in straight lines. When it's going to travel in a straight line until it hits a mirror. When it hits the mirror, it's going to bounce and it's going to travel in a straight line. So yeah, it's not going to be a sine wave thing. It's going to be an upside down uh, V. Okay, so now that we've set things up here, let's uh, go with a picture that's a little bit less cluttered. Okay, so this is what the person in the spaceship says is happening. He says that the light's just going up and coming right back down again. This is what the girl on Earth says is happening. She's saying the light is not going up and down, but it's making this weird shape here. Okay, so now let's start doing some math. Okay, so let's start with the definition, uh, you know, distance equals rate times time, the, the equation that you guys have been using since uh, junior high school. And let's rearrange that so that we have time equals distance over rate, okay? All right, now, the guy in the spaceship, he is going to define time to be the distance that the light traveled from the light to the mirror, which is L. And by the way, his tube, uh, you know, he says that the length of the tube is L and the girl on, this, the, girl on the ground, she also agrees that the, the length of the tube is L. So they, they agree on the length of the tube, okay? And they agree on the speed of sound on the speed of light, where they disagree is the time. Okay, so we got L divided by C, so that is the definition of one second for the person who's in the spaceship. Okay, now, remember that the girl on Earth, she is saying that this is actually the path that the light took, okay? So the girl on Earth is gonna say that the, the, the path that the, or the distance that the light traveled is not L but it's going to be the hypotenuse of this triangle here. So this distance right here, that's L, but the spaceship is moving and the spaceship is moving at velocity V. And so during that one second as measured by the person on Earth, that spaceship moved from here to here. So this side of the triangle here is gonna be V times T as measured by the person on Earth. Okay, and then this side of the triangle is, is L. And so then the girl on the earth says that the distance that the light traveled in one second was actually the hypotenuse of the triangle. Okay, so it's gonna be the square root of L squared plus V times T earth squared. And okay, and so then, so since time is equal to distance over rate, one second as measured by the girl on earth is gonna be this distance here that we get from Pythagoras divided by the speed of light, which both she and the person in the spaceship agree is the same. Okay, so, so far so good. All right, I trust you're taking careful notes because this derivation could very well be on the test, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Okay, so now it's just algebra from this point on. 
Okay, so we're gonna take the equation that the guy on the spaceship got. We're gonna take the equation that the girl on Earth got, okay? And we need to combine these two together. So let's take the, uh, the spaceship guy's equation and let's solve it for L. So multiply both sides by C. And now that I know what L is, I'm gonna take L and I'm, I'm gonna substitute that in for here. So wherever I see an L here, I'm gonna replace it with C times T as measured by the person in the ship. All right, so you guys agree that what I'll get will be this. So all I've done is taken the L and replaced it with C times T ship. Simple algebra, nothing tricky here, okay? All right, so now I want to simplify this equation. So let's multiply both sides by C. So now I've got uh, the C is up here on this side, okay? All right, so I get this right here. Now let's square both sides. So I'm gonna get C times T earth squared. And over on the right side, the square root goes away and I'm left with everything that was under the square root from before. So basic algebra, nothing fancy. I'm gonna pause for just a second, let you write this down. Although it's all being recorded, so you know, you can, you can go, it is being recorded, right? I better have turned on the recording. Did I, did I turn on the, yeah, boy, if I didn't turn on the recording, I'm gonna be, okay, good. <laughs> okay, I had a senior moment there. Okay, so what are we gonna do next? We'll tell you what, let's, we've got a T earth over on this side and we've got a T earth over on this side. Let's get them together. Okay, so let's subtract V times T earth squared from both sides. So basically, I just moved it from the right side to the left side. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Okay, now I've got two terms that have a T earth in them. So let's factor it out. And also, um, let's kind of do two steps at one time. This is C times T earth squared is C squared times T earth squared. V times T earth squared is V squared times T earth squared. So I'm gonna do that. And I'm also gonna factor out the T earth squared. So I kind of combine two, two algebra steps into one here. But that's, hopefully you guys agree, that's fair game to do. Okay, so I'm, I've run out of space on my screen here. So tell you what, let's take this equation down at the bottom here and let's start off with the new up at the top here. So this, what you see up here is the exact same thing I had at the bottom of the other one. Okay, so now uh, let's just uh, solve it either for, I could either solve it for T ship or I could solve it for T earth. Um, I'm gonna solve it for T ship, that's gonna be a little bit easier. Okay, so let's divide both sides by C squared. And then let's take this uh, part right here, the C squared minus V squared over C squared. Let's see if we can simplify that down a little bit. I'm gonna rewrite that as C squared over C squared minus V squared over C squared. You guys agree that my algebra is good? Not making, it, not making any mistakes here. Okay, so C squared over C squared, well, that's just one, okay? And we're pretty much there. There's just one more thing I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take the square root of both sides and voila, we are done, okay? So what we have right here, this is called the time dilation equation. And this tells us what is the difference in time between someone who's moving at some speed V and someone who is not moving? So in your homework tonight, you will uh, do calculations using this equation. Um, and on the test that we take, I can guarantee you, you'll, you'll need this equation. So uh, put it on your cheat sheet, uh, but also put the derivation on your cheat sheet as well. I think this is definitely fair game. So let's, uh, let's do a problem like you're gonna see in tonight's homework. So you guys have all heard about the infamous twin paradox. Okay, so we've got a, a boy and girl. So let's suppose that this is Ellie and this is her brother, Lucas. So they were both born on the exact same day. All right, Ellie gets on a spaceship and goes zipping around the, the universe at high speed while Lucas stays at home, okay? So you guys all know, you've all heard that when Ellie gets back, she is still gonna be young, but Lucas is now gonna be old. Now the difference depends on how fast Ellie was moving and also how long she was gone. 
So let's suppose that Ellie was moving at 99% the speed of light. So both on the trip away from Earth and also when she comes back, she was traveling at 99% the speed of light. Okay. Now let's suppose that 100 years went by for, for Lucas. Um, so the question then is how much time went by for Ellie? Okay, so you understand that because she was moving through the fabric of the universe at high speed, the molecules in her body are gonna uh, vibrate more slowly. So whatever number it is, it better be less than 100. All right, well, let's do this. Actually, how about you guys? Let, I'm gonna sit back and wait for a minute. Let's see if you guys can do it. Okay, so let's go back to this equation right here. Let's see what you guys get. Okay, so the time on Earth was 100. The velocity was 99% the speed of light. Okay, so Jaron is saying 14 years. Okay, yeah, about 14 years. All right. Um, all right, so this is the way that I did it. Okay, so one thing I did is I could have taken 99% the speed of light and multiplied, you know, 0.99 times three times 10 to the eighth. Uh, and I could have gotten it that way, but I find that it's easier to just write it down as 0.99 times C. The reason it's easier to do that is because then I can take this thing. Now remember that it's all in parentheses. So the 0.99 gets squared just like the C gets squared. Don't make that mistake. But you see what I've got now is I've got C squared over C squared. So it's actually easier to do it this way than it is to say, well, 99 or, you know, 0.99 times C is this many meters per second. I mean, you could do it either way, but this way is going to be easier. Okay, so when we're done, I get 14.1 years have gone by. All right, so when Ellie gets back from her trip, she has only aged 14.1 years, but her brother Lucas has aged 100 years. Okay. All right, everybody good with that? Now, this is real. Okay, a lot of people say, yeah, okay, you know, that's nice mathematically, but it's not real, is it? Yes, it is absolutely real. And experiments have been done that have proven that it's real. One of the very first things that was done after Einstein came up with this prediction was people took a bunch of atomic clocks. They took four super, super precise atomic clocks and they made sure that they were all synchronized. And they took two of them and they put them on an airplane and they flew it around the world. And the other two they left in the uh, laboratory. When the airplane got back after flying around the world, they compared the clocks. And sure enough, the, the clocks that had been on the airplane flying around the earth, less time had gone by for them. Now airplanes don't go very fast. And in order for this, uh, this time difference to be noticeable, you gotta be moving really fast. So the difference in time was really, really small. That's why they had to have atomic clocks. A regular old watch would not have been accurate enough to notice it. But the atomic clocks they had were super, super, super precise. And they, they did in fact show that less time had gone by. Okay, now Hiram is asking, when we use this, does time have to be in any specific unit? And the answer to that is no. As long as you use the same units for T Earth as you do for T ship, you can use any units you want. Okay, now we've only got about 10 minutes left, at least, you know, the, we could go over an hour if we had to, but I like to try and keep it under an hour. So I'm gonna move on here. Um, and I'm just gonna show you that you could take this equation, you could rearrange it any way you want. You know, you could, you could solve it for T ship or you could solve it for T earth, okay? So this, this uh, thing that's under the square root sign, the one minus V squared over C squared, it's something that you're gonna see a lot. And so some books, they call it gamma, just to make things easier, okay? So if you pick up a book and it says that T earth times gamma equals T ship, this gamma that they're talking about, that's just a, a, an abbreviation for the square root of one minus V squared over C squared. Okay, all right. And it turns out that this gamma appears not only in the time dilation equations, but it also appears in the equations for the other things that happen, which by the way, we should talk about. 
So Einstein predicted that not only does time slow down when you're moving, but also your mass increases and distances decrease, okay? So I wish we had time to go into this in more detail, um, but you know, we just don't. So let me, let me just give you the abbreviated version of this, okay? If you were to take a baseball and throw that baseball really, really, really fast to where it's like, you know, 99% the speed of light or something approaching that, then if somebody is standing by and watching that baseball go zipping by, if they were to measure the lengths of that baseball, they would, they would find that that baseball is not round. When, that's, when that baseball gets, goes zipping by, it is squished. And now, now some of you might say, well, it appears squished. No, not just appears, it is, okay? The, the dimension that is, in, that is the same as the direction of travel, that dimension actually does shrink. Now, the other dimension does not, okay? So like if I took this pen, if I threw this pen like a spear, the, the pen would be a lot shorter, but the thickness of the pen would be the same. So like the baseball, the, the width of the baseball is gonna be shorter, but the, the height of the baseball is gonna be the same, okay? And the equation that tells you how much the distance gets shrunk turns out to have that exact same gamma in it that we had from the time dilation equation, okay? So the distance as measured by a person on Earth, okay, uh, you take that and you multiply that by gamma and that'll tell you what the distance is on the ship or actually the better way to do it because if you're the person on Earth, let, let's say that I've got a, a meter stick. Let's say that my pen here is one meter long, okay? If I throw this meter stick like, like a spear, okay, the person on Earth watching it go by, if they were to measure how long that, that uh, meter stick was, how would they do it? Well, one good way would be to start the clock when the, when the front end of the meter stick reaches right where they are. So we're gonna start the clock at that time and we're gonna stop the clock at that time. So if we know how fast the meter stick is going and we know how much time it took from here to here, do you not agree that that's a good way to measure the length of something? But because our time is different than the person on the spaceship, that means that the number we come up for the distance is also gonna be uh, different as well. And the, the, the factor that determines the difference is the, exact, is the exact same square root of one minus V squared over C squared that it is for the time dilation equations, okay? So up on the top here, we see the time dilation equations. On the very bottom, we see the length contraction equations. And in the middle here, we have the equations that tell us how the mass changes. Um, and let's see, let me see a question here. So Maddie is saying, why was the electron in the gun stretched when we did the electron gun stuff? Uh, that was just because I'm a very bad artist, okay? Actually, let me rephrase that. It's because I'm a very lazy artist, okay? The way that I created that illustration was I just, I just stretched the picture just because it, it was quick and easy for me to do that. But in reality, you are exactly right, Maddie. I really should have done the opposite. So sorry if that confuses you. Okay, so uh, it, let's say that I take a baseball and I throw the, and so first off, I'm gonna measure the, the, the mass of the baseball. And let's say that the baseball is, I don't know, a half a kilogram sound about reasonable. Okay, so, so both me and my friend, we measure the mass of this uh, baseball. We both agree that it's half a kilogram while we are standing there looking at it. Okay, so now I walk back a long ways, I throw the baseball, and then as the baseball goes zipping by, my friend is now going to remeasure the mass of the baseball, but this time the, mat, the baseball is moving. Well, if I throw that baseball really fast, what's gonna happen is my friend is gonna measure a higher mass than he did when the baseball was sitting still. And these equations right here are the equations that will tell you what that mass is. Uh, and again, it's the same gamma as it was before, okay? Now, you guys have heard that it's impossible for any object to travel at the speed of light. <laughs> 
Well, you've heard that it's, tra it's impossible to travel faster than the speed of light, but in fact, it's, it's impossible for any object that has mass to even reach the speed of light, let alone exceed the speed of light. And this right here, the, the fact that the mass increases, that is the reason. So think of it like this, okay? Let's suppose that I take that baseball and I throw it so that it's moving at 90% the speed of light, okay? So it now has more mass than it did before. And I look at it and I say, well, 90%, that's not good enough. I wanna take it up higher. So I need, to, I need to exert a force in order to get it to move from 90% up to 95. But the, the amount of mass of that baseball has now increased. So if I, want to, if I want to get it to go from 90 to 95, it's going to be a lot harder than it was to get it to go from 10 to 15, okay? Because it's got more mass. And then if I want to get it from 95 up to 99, it's going to be even harder still because it's got more mass. And from, to go from 99 to 99.9, .9, I mean, you see that the, the closer this thing gets to the speed of light, the more mass it has, okay? So, the mass of this object is approaching infinity, okay? The closer it gets to the speed of light, the closer its total mass gets to infinity. So the only way that I could possibly get it to reach the speed of light would be if I, would, if I was able to apply an infinite amount of force. And it's obviously by definition impossible to apply an infinite amount of force, therefore, it is impossible to, for anything with mass to ever reach the speed of light. Now, light can go at the speed of light, but that's because it doesn't have mass. Anything with mass cannot. Okay, so we've got three minutes left. Um, and I think that we are, we are about done. There is a lot more that we could talk about. Um, one thing, yeah, in the time that remains, in the two minutes that now remain, let's talk, remember the twins. I called it the twin paradox. Well, there's nothing paradoxical about what we've just talked about. The fact that Ellie is younger than Lucas when she comes back from her trip around in, in, through space, it's not a paradox. It's totally understandable. So why do people talk about the twin paradox? Ah, okay, here's why. And so I'm gonna leave you this as a question that I want you to ponder between now and Friday. Let's play my favorite game, okay? We go to bed tonight, fall asleep. Tomorrow morning, we wake up in a, in a metal room with metal walls and with a NASA logo on the wall, and, but there's a window in it. We go over and we look out the window and off in the distance we see a light and we notice it's getting closer and closer and it goes zipping by. And so let's suppose that this is Ellie that we're talking about. Okay, so, so Ellie is standing in this windowless room and she sees this spaceship go zipping by and she says, hey, that's Lucas. And so she waves at Lucas and Lucas waves at her. Okay, but she notices that Lucas's clock is ticking more slowly than hers is, okay? Because she thinks she's at rest, okay? And so she's not surprised to see that Lucas's clock, Lucas's watch is ticking more slowly than hers is. That's not a paradox. Here's the paradox. Lucas, he thinks that he's at rest. He thinks that Ellie is the one who's moving. So when Lucas looks out his window, he sees that Ellie's clock is ticking more slowly than his. Here's the paradox. You see it now? So Lucas thinks that Ellie's going to be aging more slowly than he is, and he's right. But Ellie says, no, Lucas is the one that's aging more slowly, and she is right. How can both of them be right? That's the paradox. That's the famous twin paradox right there. So it's not the, the paradox is not that time slows down when you're moving. The paradox is that Ellie thinks that Lucas is aging more slowly. Lucas thinks that Ellie is aging more slowly. I claim that they're both right, but
but how can that be? How can they both be right? That's the paradox. Okay, so it is now two o'clock. Time to end the class. Uh, before I do, let me ask, okay, secret word. Yeah, we should do that. The, no, other than the secret word, no other questions than that? I mean, this, you guys, your minds should be blown right now. Okay, so uh, do I believe in gravity? Yeah, I definitely believe, well, I don't know, let's see. I, I'm not sure if I believe in gravity. Let's do an experiment. Yep, okay, I guess I do. Okay, Andre, what would you like the secret word to be? Oh, for the secret phrase. Well, we could. And Andre? Andre, you want to you want to come up with a secret word here? You want it to just be okay. Strawberries. Okay, that's good. Okay, so the secret word for today is strawberries. All right. So don't forget to take the quiz. Uh, oh, I guess it might be nice if I tell you what the homework is, huh? Okay. Uh, now your book does not do a good job of talking about special relativity. There's like one page where your book even, even mentions special relativity and that's not good enough. So what I've done is I have uh, copied uh, the, uh, the general physics book, you know, Miss Whitbeck's uh, physics class. They, they use a different book than we do. Their book does a pretty good job of talking about special relativity. Um, and so what I've done is I just, I just went in and scanned that entire chapter. And it's not very long, it's a short chapter. And there's not really much math in there. The, uh, what we've done is pretty much the sum total of all the math in there. Okay, so I've posted that on Canvas. Some of you may have already seen it. So if you click on the link there, you can download the, uh, what I call the handout. Uh, so read through the handout. I think it does a pretty good job of describing things and it's intended for people who are not honors physics students. So it's really easy to understand. At the, uh, at the end of the chapter, there's a whole bunch, or at the end of the handout, there's a bunch of uh, questions. And uh, so I just want you to do these ones that you see here. Five, six, nine, 13, 15, and 33. And then of course, don't forget the, uh, the daily quiz. All right, so are there any questions? Let's see, let me move the screen around. All right, not seeing any. Okay, going once, going twice, sold.